Hey there, Interwebs, and specifically Shad, because this is a response to Shadiversity's Fantasy Rearmed series. If you haven't seen it yet, I can highly recommend you do so, and the playlist is linked on screen now. I want to start off by saying that I really enjoy the series, and this video is just respectful scholarly debate. In general, I agree with a lot of what was said, and this is just the point where we differ or I have something else to add. This video is about dwarves, elves, orcs, and small folk. That's hobbits, goblins, and gnomes. Since this is a response video addressed to Shad, I'm going to use the word you for the rest of it. Dwarves. I'm afraid I have to disagree with you a lot on this matter. With regard to bows and crossbows, you said that the bow would be a good choice because their shorter draw length would mean a quicker rate of fire. While I admit that they don't need to draw the string back as far, the amount of time saved on the draw would be negligible compared to pulling an arrow out, knocking, and aiming. It gets worse, though, and that's because of the difference between force and work. Force is mass times acceleration, and is measured in pounds in the U.S. and newtons in sensible places. Work is force times distance, and is measured in foot-pounds or newton meters. Bows operate by doing work. For example, a 120-pound war bow drawn to a length of 3 feet contains 360 foot-pounds of energy. Since dwarves have a shorter draw length, they'd need to compensate with a stronger bow, or find some other way to draw the bowstring back farther. This is why crossbows developed such powerful arms, because they have a much shorter distance to accelerate the projectile. Dwarves wouldn't be able to use stronger bows, though. Since they have equivalent strength to a human, their maximum bow strength is also the same. Bows use work, but people use force. For example, the average human would be challenged to lift a 200 kilo object a meter in height, but given a block and tackle, they could do it. The amount of work hasn't changed, but by increasing the distance the rope is pulled, the force required is decreased. This is why those powerful crossbows use windlasses. Basically, dwarves using crossbows makes much more sense than using longbows, but neither makes much sense because they're really close quarters fighters. I agree that a shield would be more useful to a dwarf because they could hold one of human size but have it cover more of their body, but they don't need a shield as much as they need reach. You said they should have halberds, which I agree with, but halberds require both hands and exclude the usage of a shield. Remember, though, that halberds and poleaxes really came into their own with the advent of full-plate armor. As you and Skalagrim both pointed out, dwarves in armor are small tanks. This is where the dwarf has the advantage. Your average dwarf is about two-thirds the height of your average human. According to the square cube law, this means they'd only have four-ninths as much surface area to require armor, but since they're a bit stockier, I'll round this up to a more even one-half. Still, if they're just as strong but only have half the surface area, this means they could make their armor twice as thick. Just give a dwarf a pole arm and some double-plate armor and you've got an unstoppable halberd-swinging muscle mugget. Elves. I agree with everything you said about the bow, with regards to not being much better than humans and having a culture of archery, and I also agree with you about dual wielding. I have one quibble, though. You propose dual wielding a pair of rapiers, but I honestly think rapier and dagger would be more practical. The primary reason for this is because of reach and distance. With two rapiers, both weapons would have exactly the same effective range, and whatever you could hit with one, you could hit with the other. With a dagger in one hand, though, you'd have two ideal ranges, meaning if someone got really close up inside the range of the rapier, they'd still have the dagger to contend with. The other advantage to a rapier, specifically over an arming sword, is that rapiers tend to be more thrusty. Since elves are usually portrayed as more dexterous, they'd probably have better point control, and could have an easier time thrusting into the gaps in armor, which improved vision might make easier to spot. One last thing I'd like to mention on elves is that you assigned bows to dwarves, and I'd actually assign axes to elves. Not big, massive fantasy ones, but sensibly proportioned ones. When you fight with an axe, you don't swing and then try to stop. You swing and follow through, using the momentum to make cuts in fluid movements, which would be enhanced by elven grace, if you can call it that. In the offhand, you could carry a buckler to defend the axe hand. Orcs. I agree with you that orcish strength would make the bow far deadlier, but I wonder if they'd have enough intelligence to use it effectively, particularly at great distances when you have to account for an arc and windage and things. What I disagree with you the most on is battlefield weapons. You said that orc society is more warlike, which I won't dispute, but I think you can live in a violent society without making the leap to full battlefield weapons. It's possible orcs settle interpersonal disputes with knife fights or to first blood or grappling or something else that's less likely to be lethal to one or both parties. Think about it. If there's a fully armed fight to the death every time orcs get heated, they'll have no population left in a few years. 
I think if orcs are naturally more violent, their weapons would probably be less lethal just so they could wail on each other without outright killing the other person. I think the wooden club would probably be the sidearm of choice. They'd probably not use wooden clubs as battlefield sidearms, though, but would use its big brother, the mace, since the two are very similar in usage, but the mace is more lethal. Of course, in a battlefield situation, they'd probably just use the same things as humans, or maybe a bit bigger, and they'd have a mace on their hip instead of a sword. Hobbits, halflings, gnomes, goblins, and other shorties. I'm just going to say hobbit for the rest of this for simplicity. Like you, I think that the best way for a hobbit to win a fight is to surrender, then sneak up on their foes later with a dagger. One hobbit character I made was a sneaky dagger fighter, but then when he got old and stiffened up a bit, he switched to a spear so he could keep it a distance as well as stab up into the groin and armpits. Another one used a bill hook, which had the added benefit of hamstringing his foes. If this were a more honorable two people in a field scenario, I don't think the hobbit is as screwed as it may seem. The hobbit's biggest disadvantage is also the biggest advantage. The human is presumably used to fighting other equally tall opponents, so to attack a hobbit, all of their blows would need to be down at an awkward angle. For the hobbit, this means all the attacks are coming from more or less the same direction, which makes them easier to defend against. When discussing dwarves, I said that because of the square cube rule, they'd only have half as much surface area to armor. For a hobbit, this is only a quarter, and though they may not be as strong overall as a dwarf or a human, they would be proportionally stronger just like how ants are the strongest animals by body mass, though not to the same degree. You see, mass or body weight is a function of volume, but strength is a function of cross-sectional surface area of our muscles. Hobbits would be stronger than you think, and a shield which a human might consider too big or heavy might not trouble a hobbit. They're small targets behind big shields, which you mentioned. They just have to hold one above themselves at an angle to deflect almost any attack that comes in. Humans are also more used to attacks coming in from about shoulder height. This means, historically, armor wasn't as protective below the mid-thigh, since attacks weren't likely to go that low, and it was easy enough to move the leg out of the way. This is true for hobbits, too, except the safe zone would start around the waist instead. They have a quarter the surface area, and really only need to armor the top half. Combined with greater proportional strength, they could put the weight only where it needs to be, and have a very well-protected top half and be safe. The human, on the other hand, is much more threatened. If a hobbit is only waist-high, then most of their attacks are going to be against the human's least well-armored areas, especially if they're targeting the joints. A dagger thrust up into the groin will stop anyone from fighting, and if it hits the femoral artery, it'll stop them from living pretty quickly, too. The back of the knee was one of the least protected parts of any armor. A hobbit would have no difficulty reaching around and slicing the hamstring. This won't kill the human, but it does ground them for the coup de grace. Quick stabbing and slicing attacks are the exact tactics the Zulu Ikwa was designed for, being a long spearhead on a short shaft. The shaft would also give the hobbit just a bit more reach to thrust up at the human. The other weapon hobbits could use to become more deadly? Poison. Poisoned weapons weren't so common in battle, historically, because most wounds with battlefield weapons were easily lethal on their own. For a hobbit, though, the killing blow doesn't come as easily, but landing a poisoned slice on the back of the leg and running away might be just the thing. It really seems hobbits are best suited to sneaky ninja tactics, and there is one stereotypical ninja weapon I think would be perfect for them, the Kusari Gama. They don't have to be super strong to offend with the weighted end, because angular momentum is doing the work, and the long chain means suddenly they're the ones with the reach advantage. If they are really good shots, then they'd be able to put that weighted end right where they want it, getting the advantage of being a good shot without the drawback of being a weak throw. They could also use the chain to entangle the opponent's weapon or legs before rushing in with the sickle end. If they haven't already wrapped the legs and pulled the human over, they could hook the knee with the sickle, hamstringing the person, and then use the point to go through the gaps or weak points in any armor. As you said, go for the legs. That concludes this reply to Shad, and again, I want to stress that this is only respectful disagreement. I love the series, and I love the fact that we can have this discussion. If I didn't like it, I wouldn't waste my time replying. I do plan to make more reply videos for other creatures, as well as a fantasy race weapon analysis of my own for one he's neglected so far. Anyway, thanks for watching, go watch his if you haven't already, and have a nice day.